Welcome everyone. My name is Angie Peacock. I'm a psychiatric drug withdrawal consultant and a healing coach. If you are watching this from Facebook, please like the post or the page. If you're on YouTube later, please hit subscribe and like or comment. And I try to answer every comment that I see. Um, today we are being joined by Mark Horowitz and I have been wanting to talk to him for years because we've run in the same circle and we work with the same people just from different angles. So I'm so excited to bring you Dr. Mark Horowitz today. Mark, welcome. Nice to be here. Good to talk to you finally, Angie. After yep. a... We have lots to get to. Oh my gosh. So I'm going to like, just jump right in. Okay. Mark, can you tell us like, what got you interested in psychiatry in particular and what has your, been, your, your experience been learning about this topic? Sure. Shall, shall I just introduce myself to people who don't maybe yeah. know me? Yeah. So uh, right here. So yeah. My, my name is Mark Horowitz. Um, I'm a I'm a training psychiatrist and I work as a clinical research fellow in the National Health Service in London, although I'm originally from Australia. And I did a PhD in how antidepressants work uh, at King's College London, and I've done a lot of writing about uh, safely how to safely stop antidepressants and other psychiatric drugs, and I now run a clinic in um, the National Health Service in, in my trust, I'll be able to stop antidepressants and benzodiazepines uh, and drugs like that, uh, which we're trying to expand. Um, and I, I, I also offer academic consulting to people who contact me from outside of England on how to safely stop their drugs. Uh, so how did, I, how did I get into this line of work? Um, so how did I become interested in psychiatry? I guess that's, I mean, that's uh, that's a long time ago, I guess for the same reason that everybody gets interested in it because I wanted to fix my fucked up family and my fucked up younger self. Uh, same. I mean, yeah. I've only seen one person deny that on Twitter somewhere. No, that's not why I got interested in this. I'm like, I, okay, I don't believe you, but all right. <laughs> maybe there are less self-focused people out there than me. Uh, but <laughs> yeah. you know, I... I I come from a very neurotic Jewish family. If, if you've ever watched a Woody Allen film and you've seen people shouting at each other whilst eating, whilst whatever, yeah. that's my family. It's quite mad. Uh, psychiatry has not helped me to solve it at all. It's made Same. it worse. Yes. Uh, anyway, I learned that the hard way. Uh, and how do I get interested in deep prescribing? Um, so uh, I... So... Basically, I, I I pursued a career in in psychiatry. I went to medical school in Sydney. I did uh, I started my training as a psychiatry registrar in Sydney, and I thought that uh, the treatments in this in this field aren't effective enough. We need to make we need to find out why they work, why they don't work, how to make them better. And I moved to London to do a PhD in how do antidepressants work and what is the biology of depression. Uh, you know, I, I guess I, I thought very much about the biopsychosocial model. I was interested in stress hormones. I was listening to Robert Sapolsky. Uh, and then towards the end of my PhD, I came across an article talking about withdrawal effects from antidepressants. And that was very startling to me because at that point, I'd been on an antidepressant for 15 years. I was a miserable 21-year-old for a variety of reasons. I didn't like medical school very much. I was a frustrated, I don't know, writer, scientist, uh, and I couldn't stand memorizing things. And I I had a I had about a five-year existential dilemma, talking about quitting it every day, um, on top of a whole lot of things from family, childhood. Uh, and I went to see a doctor and got given an antidepressant. So I was taking an antidepressant from third year medical school. Um, and so by the time I read this article about withdrawal effects, I've been on the drugs for 15 years. And I I sort of had in the back of my mind, maybe I should come off my antidepressant, partially because I'd had a lot of health problems over that period of time. I had severe problems with daytime tiredness, memory and concentration issues. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I had at one point in my life had a brilliant memory. I considered it, you know, one of my special uh talents and and as the years went on my memory was terrible right I couldn't remember patients I couldn't remember what I'd learned I, I sort of went from being you know very good in the class to being near the dunce yeah. uh, 
and and I was tired all the time and I went to doctors because I, I came from a very, I mean, that's another, that's another element to things. I came from a very medical family. So medications were a very big part of our world. My mum was a pharmacist and there was a, a drug, you know, to treat every, every, uh, every ailment. So that was definitely, I came from a highly medicalized, pharmaceuticalized family. Um, uh, so I, I went to see doctors and I got, I, I attracted various diagnoses, including chronic fatigue syndrome and eventually narcolepsy was the, the uh, diagnosis that wow. stuck. And so I was told the reason why I'm having all these sleeping problems and memory and concentration issues is because of narcolepsy that led to more medications, stimulants, and then sleeping drugs. You know, I sort of had, I had these spreadsheets of if I take a bit more sleeping drug and a bit less stimulant, can I manage being anxious and tired and basically for about 10 or 15 years, you know, I, no, I, there was no, there was no, there was no, uh, whatever magical concoction that worked. And I was a, a walking human burette full of different drugs. And I sort of landed, um, at the end of my PhD, you know, I thought maybe I'll, maybe I should come off this antidepressant. Maybe it's part of what's causing these problems. And mm -hmm. I, I, uh, I've told the story a few times. I, uh, looked up all the academic literature about how to come off the drugs, and they all said come off in four weeks. Mild and mild and uh, limiting, mild and self-limited problems with withdrawal. I looked up uh, the, uh, I looked up Google, and I found you know a very different story. I found surviving antidepressants early on, saying people have huge trouble coming off these drugs. It can take months and years, and I guess as a fairly institutionalized person, as someone who spent my entire life in academic halls doing degrees and jumping through exam hoops I sort of didn't know who to trust I sort of thought I oh, people people you know, on the internet they have valid experiences you know that does sound a bit worrying but I'm so used to following what what, what professor says so I sort of um split the difference went halfway and I came off over four months and I ended up in you know a world of pain I you know I wake up feeling absolute terror like I was being chased by a wild animal I had you know, basically panic attacks that lasted for 12 hours of the day. I get a, a bit of relief in the evenings. Mm -hmm. I took up running and I ran until my feet bled because it gave me a little bit of reprieve. And a few weeks into that, I thought, I'm, I can't, I can't keep living like this. Mm -hmm. um, and basically I ended up moving back from London where I was living at the time to Sydney in Australia, where I basically crumpled as a theoretically grown, fully grown man in my thirties on my parents floor like a small child weeping mm -hmm. i went back on the drugs which actually relieved things relieved a lot of the agitation and, and, and terror that i had over a few weeks put it in the back of my mind for a uh a, a couple of years and for a variety of reasons actually ended up seeing more doctors getting more medications to treat narcolepsy ended up on five psychiatric drugs at the end of at the at the peak of my psychiatric career although it was sort of prescribed by a combination of sleep specialists and psychiatrists so it wasn't it wasn't completely for mental health reasons but I ended up being on two antidepressants Lexapro and Remeron or Metazapine uh uh Ritalin um uh Zopiclone and a drug that they give for narcolepsy called gamma hydroxybutyrate which mm -hmm. is known as a brand name Zyrum, which is supposed to make you put you into a deep sleep it's also known uh on the on the streets as grievous bodily harm a a party drug and a date rape drug you know part of the reason why it's date rape drug is because it puts you into a deep sleep mm -hmm. so i was i was a i was a very complicated chemical concoction uh like up fight. in the morning and down at night and Riding the roller coaster every day. Yeah. yeah. So Zyrum is a funny thing. You've got to wake up in the middle of the night to take a second dose. So you have to oh have an alarm. So anyway, I, I wow. anyway, that was a that was a strange period of my life. That was quite a anyway, I guess I was a I was somewhat of a hardcore drug user, uh, but all prescribed by doctors. Um mm -hmm. in any case, uh I basically about five years ago I decided to you know, after basically being almost non-functional, I was walking around the hospital with a piece of paper trying to remember who I'd just seen. If I lost it, I had no idea. I felt completely embarrassed about how absent I was. And I was starting to think that it's becoming unethical for me to be a doctor because I'm just so um, absent. And so and so, so I, I took a leave of absence from my work, which I haven't, which I haven't gone back to in, in, in Australia. 
And I decided this time that the experts in this field were clearly people on surviving antidepressants. And I took their advice and I came off my drugs slowly. And I've done that over the last five years. And I'm now at the, not quite the tail end, but the last stage I hope of coming off my drugs. So I actually in, in 14 days, I will be off escitalopram or Lexapro, which is a drug I've been on for 20 years. So that's a big, that's a big moment in my life. Amazing. Uh, Congratulations. Been, thank you. Thanks, Angie. Uh, I've been micro tapering that the last while, and I'm, you know, down to the tiniest last uh, 0.02 milligrams of a, of a, of a drug now, of, of the drug now. And I'm down to the last 0.9 milligrams of metazapine or Remeron, which is a bit more, uh, I'm not sure how long that will take me. Hopefully in the next few months, I'm hoping that by, summer this year I might be uh, off my medications which I'm looking forward to a lot uh and so I guess that's how I came around to deprescribing through first-hand experience and I spent a lot of time reading about it and writing about it and trying to do bits of research in it and that's where that's what I do in my clinical practice now is is mostly deprescribing or doing research and advocacy around it amazing so can you share some of your research? I often refer to your research as, to me, the only thing that's proven what the layperson community has found, that people have to taper very slowly and it should be patient directed. So can you talk a little bit about all the research you've done in this area and maybe any surprising findings that you found or any pushback that you've received? Right. I mean, so, you know, in 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 terms of tangible practical research, we haven't done very much except for surveys mm -hmm. um, because we've tried to get studies funded to, to you know, compare hyperbolic tapering with linear tapering, which hasn't been funded so far, although we haven't quite given up. Um, although that's not true. There's, there's a study happening in Australia where they are testing hyperbolic tapering versus care as usual, which is probably the most interesting piece of research happening at the moment. Um, yes. So in terms of what I've done, I mean, I, I've basically turned a lot of what I've learned on online forums, you know, translated into into the academic literature. I mean, so the main thing that I focused on is the the relationship between the dose of a drug and its effect on the brain. Um, at the risk of maybe boring people to their to their um, to tears, should I just share a, should I share a slide or something yeah, for a second? That's a great so, idea. Yeah, let me make you the host so that it'll yeah. let you share. I I often show the hyperbolic taper, <laughs> so yeah. go for it. I'm a visual person too. Okay. Let me see. Uh, so let me hold on. Let me just share my screen very briefly. I guess it'll summarize things. Sorry, excuse my very messy. It's beautiful. It's like mine. <laughs> Sorry, it's a disaster. Do I have this? Okay. Uh, does this have it? Yeah. Okay. So possibly people have seen these kind of things before, but I'll I'll do it. Uh, so. Uh, so basically, the important bit is, so this is, so this is, it's not studies that I did, but the studies that, that have been done about 15 years ago at Harvard. Uh, this shows the dose of an antidepressant and its effect on the brain. It happens to be on the serotonin transporters. Um, and this was, this, this sort of study was done by putting radioactive dyes into people's veins, which goes into their brains. So you can see how much these receptors are occupied by the drug um, when you're on different doses. And so you can see doses down on the bottom here and effect on the brain is here. And the key aspect of this is not a straight line. So doubling the dose doesn't double the effect. Um, this is called a hyperbola, which you might remember from high school. Um, and and it, it's sort of an example of the law of diminishing returns. When there's not much drug about in the system, every extra milligram of drug has a lot of receptors to attach to sort of like in musical chairs, when you start off, there's lots of chairs available to sit down on, it's an easy game. As there's more and more drug in the system, more and more of the receptors are occupied by drug. So every extra milligram of drug has less and less effects, like at the end of musical chairs where most of the chairs are taken away. And what this means is, so the most common doses of citalopram being used out there is 20 milligrams and 40 milligrams. Uh, but a tiny, tiny dose, like five milligrams, much smaller than the, than the smallest tablet available, actually has about three quarters of the effect of those very high doses. In fact, three quarters of the effect of about 60 milligrams. And that tells us something about what happens when you try to come off the drugs. So a lot of doctors will say, 
all right, let's come off carefully. We'll come off in, say, four steps. We'll go down from 20 to 15 to 10 to 5 to 0. And intuitively, that makes sense because they're evenly spaced in terms of dose. But when you look at the effect on the brain, which is what you're really experiencing, you know, in terms of symptoms, that first reduction causes hardly any change at all in terms of effect on the brain. And most people say that was okay or only a little bit unpleasant. But when you go from 15 to 10, there's a bigger change in effect on the brain. That's a bit more unpleasant and so forth. So when you go from 10 to five, it's about twice as big again. And the final reduction is from five to zero. It's like jumping off a cliff. It's a huge change in effect. You know, I sort of say, imagine people walking down, you know, a garden path. It starts off a little bit, um, you know, down sloping, then it becomes very down sloping, and then it becomes a vertical cliff. And people fall off this cliff um, and get into huge trouble. And because most doctors aren't aware of this relationship, they think, well, if you're having huge trouble now, you must need the drug. You know, if you're in, if you're, if you're, if you're panicked, if you're anxious, if you're depressed, it must be a sign that you need the drug, rather than you've just chopped off this in huge, you know, neurobiological cliff. Uh, and patients, you know, again and again, uh, report exactly this pattern of symptoms. The first few milligrams are okay. The last ones are the hardest. There's a little bit of research backing this up now as well. Um, and, and Mark, is that is that kind of mean like the body's always trying to reach homeostasis, so it's easier for it to kind of bounce back from a very small increment. But when you do something that drastic, the body just just cannot like adjust. That's the way I think about it. Is there a better way to explain that for people that yeah, don't that, understand? That, yes, that's exactly right. Can I uh, can I unload on you the analogy that I use a lot these days? Yes. I use two analogies okay. when I talk about tapering. Um, you know, tapering is readjusting to, to different levels of, of drug. And I, I the, the, the simplest analogy I use is like coming down from a building. So if you're on 100 milligrams of a drug, your brain has gotten used to that amount of drug over several years. And if you go to zero, so the worst way to get off the top of a building is to jump off the top. If you jump off the top and go to the bottom, that's like throwing your drugs in the bin, yeah. cold turkey. Yeah. And that is, you know, and that sometimes can be exactly like jumping off the top of a tall building. You can end up in a world of pain. Yeah. And that's because, you know, you have thrown your, your system, exactly you've mentioned homeostasis, your system adapts to, you know, match the chemicals it's being exposed to, like it does for caffeine mm -hmm. or nicotine or, or opioids. And if it's completely changed in a second, it completely throws it out of whack you know, destabilizes things. It, it, it's it's putting a huge stress on the, the the body, the system, the brain. And so what makes more sense is coming down floor by floor, you know, which is what tapering is. You're giving a bit of a change, but allowing your brain to readjust. And even better is coming down step by step, which might be what micro tapering is or doing very small reductions. It, it allows your brain to readjust. Mm -hmm. the, the other analogy I use to mix, to slightly mix metaphors here, which I thought, I think people understand and I, and I, and I kind of um, use throughout my textbook is the bends, which is a little, takes a second to explain, but I think is very useful. The, the bends is what people get when they go deep sea diving. Yep. Yeah. You, know, you go, mm -hmm. and if you come up too quickly, you get, the bends. and it's a bit famous because Radiohead yep. made a song called the bends. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's the technical, it's, it's a, it's a term for decompression sickness. And I think it's a, got a very good analogy for tapering. So what happens is you go down to the bottom of the ocean, it's very deep, and there's a lot of pressure on you. And that pressure pushes gas into your vessels. And you're told you've got to come up to the surface slowly. Because if you come up too fast, the pressure is relieved as you come up closer to the top of the ocean, and the gas whizzes out of your vessels. And the gas can cause damage. And, and, and the bends you know, it involves dizziness and headache and feeling crappy, not that dissimilar from withdrawal. Mm -hmm. And the reason why you come up slowly is you come up slowly enough for your body to be able to readjust to the gas that's, that's whizzing out. Um, and, the, and the treatment for the bends is going back down to the bottom of the sea, except that's too dangerous. So rather than doing that, they put you in a recompression chamber, which basically simulates being at the bottom of the sea by, mm -hmm. by being in a very high pressured chamber. And when things have settled down, they reduce the pressure more slowly. And that's Sounds how you like reinstatement it. almost. <laughs> exactly. So yeah. that's exactly what it means. It's exactly yeah. reinstatement. So <laughs> same thing, you've been exposed to a drug. The drug has jacked up levels of chemicals in your brain. And if you jump off it quickly, it causes huge strife, like shooting up the top of the sea. And so you've got to come down at a rate you can tolerate. And withdrawal symptoms are the feedback about how quickly you can tolerate things. So if you get them, you know, slow down, go back a step. 
Mm -hmm. And that's why, and maybe we'll come to it, which is why I think reinstatement often is very useful for people because it puts, it's like the same as being, as being um, uh, recompressed, although there's complexities which we can also talk about. Mm -hmm. um, and, that's, and that's the analogy I use for people. So I, I see tapering as a process of working out what's the rate of going down that your body can tolerate based on mm -hmm. your physiology, your age, how long you've been on the drugs, what drug you've been on. And that's why, you know, that patient-centered aspect of it and, you know, taking the feedback from withdrawal symptoms is so vitally important to work out what's the right yes. rate for the body. You Absolutely. Know, and I, I think know. that's that's kind of my role in the as a coach is helping people listen to their own body, like more than anything. And I, and I tell them often, you can get opinions from everyone. You can go to Mark and you can go to your own doctor and they're going to tell you all these things that you should do, but it comes down to, you're the one that has the symptoms and you're the one that has to hear. It's almost like a skill that we develop. And I've noticed I'll, if I ask one of my tapering support circles, there was two women last week that said, I can't explain it, Angie. It's just like, I know it's just, I feel it. Okay. Time to, time to make a cut. You know, I think that's best case scenario. Often we have a lot of patients that have been, or people that have been very destabilized along the process, usually from doctors that are cutting cold, you know, cold turkeying or rapid tapering or adding in this drug and that drug and this drug. So there's lots of complexities. And I know that's, those are some of the people that we see Mark is that they've just been given so many meds, their nervous system is completely confused. Um, and I know a lot of the advice in the withdrawal community is just hold, 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 or go back up. And even those people, this is one of the questions I had for you the most is because these are the people that I work with. I think they find me because they're like at the end of their rope and they know I had a pretty severe experience so that I can relate to them. But it feels like those people are kind of being told to stable out and they try perhaps but it's just not sustainable for them for one reason or another. It's too intense. The severes are out of, or the symptoms are out of control. So what do you think about that specific group of people that have just been so destabilized? Yeah. So, so, uh, so it's a very, you know, it's a very difficult area and there's, you know, uh, lots of well-meaning people have different views because, mm -hmm. you know, what it comes down to is, I think the, I think the, the honest answer is, I have no idea. Is the, is, exactly. is, the, is, the, is the real? I answer. love that you said that. So yes. There, there's you know there's no textbook. There's no research. You know if there was studies where people who were highly destabilized were randomized to holding, you know reinstatement, micro tapering, and they could see who does better. You know based on which drug, we could have an answer. But you know everybody is speculating based on what they've seen. Yes. So I think that's the first thing to say, you know, because everyone wants to have someone with a, with a brilliant answer and everyone has differing experience what they've seen right these are the ideas that i bring to to, to when i when i when i address those sort of things um and i the reason why i use analogies so much is because there's so little science i'm trying to work out what conceptual framework makes sense you know and i'm happy to discard it if there's information that doesn't match it so if i go back to the so, so you're basically talking about a group of people that you know makes my heart sink, and and I'm sure it makes your heart sink because it's very hard to know what to do. People who have, you know, they've been in, they've been in such a mess that don't quite know which way is up. So when yes. I'm talking about, so when I say give my example of the bends, so the ideal situation is is sometimes I'm contacted, I'm contacted by people who say I've been on a drug for ten years, how can I come off? And you know, I love being asked that because mm -hmm. you know I. Most of the time that works out quite well. Not always, but basically right. I say, look, you're going to go slowly. You're going to go at a rate you can tolerate. You're going to go very carefully at the end. If things go wrong, we're going to slow down and go back. You know, you're basically starting with a fresh, you know, a blank slate. Right. Um, and the person, their their starting point is different than say someone like me. That and, that and that that reminds me of your research. And I think I had seen this pattern before I read your research, but I was like, it seems to predict if you've had lots of withdrawal attempts, you're on and off a bunch of drugs, long-term use. Your last taper was not, didn't go so well. You seem to have a little bit harder of a time. That is not a definitive, like it's not for everyone, but it seems to predict that. So someone's starting at like just relatively cool. I just want to get pregnant. I'm 23. I just want to come off my Prozac. It seems to go a little bit better than someone with a more complicated history. Yeah. I agree completely. And and that's, yes. So I, I, I you know, there's debate about why, why is that? I mean, there's two things. If you've had trouble in the past, one, it predicts the future. You know, if you've had, you know, if you've run a 10 second mile, 
10 second 100 meter last week you could probably do it again this week so you've had trouble coming off the drugs in the right. past you know predicts the future that's one thing and then there's a whole you know area of you know is there sensitization that happens that coming off the drugs multiple times mm -hmm. makes it harder and harder and you know i think right. from what i've seen the answer looks like it is you know the answer is yes yeah. it does seem you know mm -hmm. people, people throw around all these words sensitization and kindling and i'm not sure everyone is on the same page about what they mean but 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 yeah. but yes i do see people that have have tried to come off multiple times it does seem to get harder and harder so i wonder if there is some kind of cumulative irritation mm -hmm. injury or damage that happens right um so the, yeah. the people that we're talking about who are kind of in huge strife um and they're not quite sure so people in my thing who have they come down too fast they go back that tends to always you know almost always work then the people who are, and they're not quite sure what's going on. They've, they've taken an antibiotic. They've gone down too quickly. They've, they've added another drug. They've come off something. They've been reinstated. What do they do then? You know, it's very hard to say. I mean, I've got to say, I do have an inclination towards holding because I, mm -hmm. I think for, for a few reasons, I often think when people have arguments to go down or up or do nothing, you know, sometimes the arguments, they say, I want to get off this drug because it's bad for me. I want to go up because I think reinstatement might help me and I was better when I was on a higher dose or maybe I'll hold. Often I think when there's arguments in every direction, then you just take the average and do nothing. You know, I, I sort of think the, the other analogy I sometimes use is, you know, when you're in a shower and you turn it to the hot side and there's a delay and it doesn't get any hotter. So you turn the hot water side further and it still doesn't get any hotter. And so you turn it further and then it all kind of, because of the delay, it all kicks in and suddenly you're scalding hot. Fire, yes. Then you turn it, then you turn it the other way because it's now scalding hot. So you turn it towards the cold and it doesn't get any colder. So you're scalding hot. You turn it again and then it catches up and you get up, end up being freezing. I think a lot of that happens with these medications because I think withdrawal effects can be delayed. Delayed, you yes. Know, things that are happening to you can be cumulative and be delayed. Yeah. And so what's happening to you today may not be because of the dose change you made yesterday. It may be the last three months. Exactly. And so in general, I've got to say, I did this for myself, did this for, for patients that I see. If you're not sure what the hell's going on, I often think it's better to do nothing, just to wait for things to come out, just to know what you're doing. Because also, sometimes also, if you just do something, if you go down or you go up and things get a bit better, you're not quite sure, was it just because of the change I just made or was it what happened last week? So I, I so even when people are in trouble, I will sometimes say to hold and people say, but I'm feeling so bad, I must do something, which of course is the, is the, you know, is the pointiest end of that stick because people yes. say, I can't live like this. Yeah. Um, and then you've got to make some decision. Uh, you know, I, I often keep in mind, so I keep in mind two hypotheses. So one, and this comes down to what is withdrawal, you know, uh, is withdrawal, you know, the difficulty you get in coming off the drugs you know, or is withdrawal an injury to the brain that happens in the process? And I, and I'm I, glad you, I'm glad you brought that up. You know, I, I hear people, sorry, you go. Oh, well, cause I, I, I almost hate that we call it withdrawal so much. I think it's withdrawal. If you're a normal person with no symptoms and you just want to come off, that's withdrawal. But the people that I see, they are getting injured from an antibiotic or from six weeks of antidepressant use or from, you know, 40 years of, all kinds of antidepressants, but it seems to be more of an injury and it's very similar despite whatever drug they're on. Do you know what I mean? Uh, yes. I, mean, I, think a, I, I, think a, I think it's a continuum because, you know, the person who's been on the drug for two years and comes off over six months without huge trouble, right. you know, um, I think there's something happening to their brain. You know, the reason why they come off over six months is because it's, you know, it's to do with, I guess the difficulties come the combination of exposure to the drug and withdrawal from the drug. And I think yes. they're both doing something. They're both, I because, see. Yes, you know, yes. Withdrawal, you, know, you only get withdrawal after exposure. So there's right. some relation. And the quicker you come off, the worse it is. So I think it's very hard. You know, very people start point. being incoherent when they talk about this because it's very hard to unpick. I think there's, I think there's probably, you know, damage done from being on these drugs that is somehow exacerbated by coming off too quickly. But I don't quite understand the relationship going to the my analogy of the bends you know i sort of think well if gas shoots out of your vessels okay you can improve things by going you know recompressing going back down unless the gas shooting out has caused damage itself mm. so this is why i'm thinking with with and i don't and I, i'm trying to hold these ideas in my mind because i don't know you know if the process of coming off drugs very quickly is causing frank 
damage, then there's two things going on. There's the trouble that comes from withdrawing too quickly, which is destabilizing what your brain is used to. And there's some kind of direct damage or irritation from coming off the drugs. And they sort of imply different things. So for example, with my analogy, if gas shooting out of your vessels in the bends has caused tissue damage, you can't reverse that by going down in the sea right. again. Right. If it's come from the destabilization of changing the pressures so much, that can be improved. So I'm trying to hold those ideas in my mind. That's that really good. Point. I really agree with that. And and yeah. the problem I think is we don't know which one it is for which person. Yeah, I mean, or to what degree, and so that's right. why that's why the way I treat this is, um, you know, I'm sort of walking a bit in the dark. Everyone's walking in the dark. You know, yes. anyone who says they yeah. know how to solve all this stuff, no, you know, run, but, run, no. yeah. If you hear that, run. <laughs> And so you're doing little, so everything I do is a test. So if someone's in this huge, you know, if someone's in this huge trouble, they've been on five drugs, they've come off drugs, they've been on antibiotics, they want to stop, they want to keep going up, they don't know. I say, okay, if you, you first of all, my, 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 I say my first protocol is probably to pause for a month or two just to see what happens. Yeah. Then, and then, you know, to, to sort of work out the arguments and then try something a little bit. So, mm. you know, if you think you want to try going down, then go a little bit and see what happens. You know, don't, don't, I don't think there's any situation, almost no situation, where it makes sense to just stop at cold turkey because you've decided it's right. bad for you. I don't think that makes sense. Yes. You know, it might make sense to go quicker, but everything I do, I do it, I do it gradually. If you're going to go quicker, go a bit quicker. You know, if you're going at 10% and you think I can't stand this, then try going at 12 and a half percent. You know, don't don't go and stop it. And if you're going to try reinstatement, you know, whatever everything I've said, I would say, you know, try a little bit. Don't if you know you want to go up, I wouldn't go back to the full dose. You know, try going up half a milligram or going up 10% and see what you find. And often there's a bit of, you know, trial and error. If it helps you, you know, that's that's great. That's, that might be the answer. So I, I approach everything with, you know, a bit of uncertain, acknowledging the uncertainty, yeah. trying to make sense of it and doing little bits. Yeah. You know, I, I hope one day there'll be more research and I'll be able to be a bit more confident. But I, mm -hmm. that's a bit where I'm left, where yeah. for some people I think reinstatement so I've got to say, I think I maybe differ from a lot of benzo groups who seem to say reinstatement is the is the devil. Uh, and I understand that. I, I know people can react badly sometimes to reinstatement. Mm -hmm. I didn't try these things cautiously, but I've got to say, I've seen quite a lot of success in people reinstating antidepressants and benzodiazepines, even weeks and sometimes months after going down. Mm -hmm. So I'm not... I'm not quite sure I'm on the same page as everyone who says you should never reinstate and never go up. You know, personally, you know, I saved my life myself with reinstatement. You know, I, mm. when I was in huge trouble, I talked about, you know, being in terror, not being able to sleep, you know, basically being quite mm -hmm. suicidal. What got me out of that state was I inched up on my drug. You know, I went from, I was at one milligram of Lexapro, I didn't rush up to, to 20, but I ended up on 20. I went up over about two months and that eats things off. And if, if that, if I hadn't done that, I'm not sure I would have been here today. And I, and I, and I'm not the only person I wouldn't, you know, I don't want to offer my anecdote to. Of course, because <laughs> I could give you an opposite one, maybe, but, right. but no. Right. And I, I have like so many thoughts right now, but one of them is, um, could it be a third possibility that the withdrawal attempt can cause some kind of hypersensitivity. So then when the person does try to reinstate, it's that that's happening. There's some other phenomenon happening besides, you know what I mean? Because because I mean, some that's... of them even have like hypersensitivities to magnesium or vitamin D, like they any substance that comes in, the body's like, no. Yeah. Could it be some I mean, third I mean, phenomenon? People, I, I mean, I I mean, there's no doubt that people become hypersensitive during withdrawal. You know, I think that's you know, that's the, the, the brain is destabilized, it's being asked to do lots of things. It's sort of like, you know, your immune system's down, you know, when you're worn out, you know, you're right. more prone to getting bugs. So, you know, clearly people are hypersensitive to lots of things like antibiotics and steroids and alcohol and other drugs that they would normally not have had a big, big trouble with. I guess the, the central issue is here, have they become hypersensitive to the drug that they're on? You know, right. that, that's what this is all about. This is what paradox yes, it's that is. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm not so clear on that. I sometimes no. I think I've seen paradoxical reactions and people going up, but I've got to say more often than not, when people have increased their dose carefully, I've often seen people's state improve. Yeah, uh, and I was going to say I've noticed the same phenomenon, I, but I would also notice I've also noticed 
I can think of like four people right now that tried to reinstate or tried to go up and that made them worse. So I always, I'm always air on the side of informed yes. consent. I'll like everything that you do, it's either make you better, worse, or you stay the same. Are you willing to take that risk? If it improves your life, you know, if it, if it makes you better, great. If it makes you a little worse, can you handle it? If nothing happens, can you handle that? But I don't want to scare them by saying like, you could be worse because I would say like 80% they're okay. But there's that 20 that I've noticed that don't, have a good time or other people in the community have given them advice to keep going up and up and up and up and up until you find stability. And now they're stuck on four milligrams of Ativan. Like they don't want to do, then you have to taper from that amount. That's. So, so I'd say two things. So one, I wouldn't go up and up and up if things aren't working. That's, that's why my sort of, uh, you know, trial it, see what happens. And based on that, make the next steps. I wouldn't keep, so if something wasn't working, I wouldn't keep pushing it. So that, you know, that's the, because that's, you know, if, it, if it's not doing anything, because basically, you know, I haven't, you know, a lot of people are you're trying to work out not what's good, but what's the mm -hmm. least bad option. Right. You know, that's the first right. thing. And so feeling really unwell and being on less medication is better than being feeling really unwell and being on more medication. Lots of medication. Yes. So in other words, if reinstatement's not working, I wouldn't keep pushing it. That doesn't good. make sense. Yeah. The, the second thing I'd say is a group of people that has really made me uh, think, which is, and I'm talking about antidepressants, mostly, as I pull into my mind, but sometimes benzos, people who have gone off too quickly, you know, end up in huge trouble, akathisia or huge agitation, feeling really bad. They reinstate and they feel worse. Their symptoms get yes. worse, they get more symptoms, yes. and they wait, they persevere with it, and their symptoms, the worsening improves, and their symptoms resolve. So they, mm -hmm. they go through a period, I've seen and it happen for a couple of months, where they feel worse and they think, should I keep this or not? And I don't know because I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I don't, I'm not confident enough to say, yes, you must push through this, it'll get better. But they have for a variety of reasons, and they things have gotten better and, and that's and it's uh it's improved. Mm -hmm. I still don't say to people, you gotta hold it, you gotta hold it, you know, it'll get better, it'll get better. Because I've had trouble in the past where people haven't been happy at all with me suggesting reinstatement. Right. Um so I don't so I I I sort of see all these different patterns of response. Same. Yep. And it's very hard to pick something. So, you know, there is a group of people who get worse and say, I don't want to be on this stuff anymore. And they, and they drop it. Yeah. Um, and I'm not, but I have this question back in my mind, if they hung on, would things settle down? Mm -hmm. um, but I've also heard of people who have stuck, who've, who've, who've stuck with reinstatement for months and nothing's improved. So. Right. Um, right. I and, and I think here I'll offer my experience. I mean, obviously if I knew then what I knew now, when I was taken off cold Turkey, Maybe I would have made a different choice, but I definitely had this intuition about I can't I can't take this drug one more time if I do. And this is not me saying that I advocate for abruptly abrupt substation. I do not. OK, I don't even know how I made it through my withdrawal. I just knew I felt I, I can't there's no I can't handle it, you know, and that and 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 I also felt like that's the decision I'm making and I have to let the chips fall where they may. And again, I am not advocating this for anyone. I'm telling you what happened to me. But I have lived with the consequences. I'm eight years off and I still have symptoms lingering. And yeah. I, I don't, you know, I think my drug history was way complicated. I'm a severe case. I am not the norm that is seen in this community even. But um, yeah, so I don't know. There's no good answer. But I, I think to sum this all up, it really is a personal decision. You have to get educated, pull all the information together and you do what makes the most sense for you. Because we don't, we just don't know. Would you agree? I mean, I mean, I mean, it's a bit it's a bit hard to say to pull the information together because that means scrolling well, through web, yeah, the web groups. Yeah, you know, I look. I basically think that when you make you know because what happens in these circumstances is people are in you know in terrible states. Yes. You know, and they're you know they're screaming and they're and they're you know they're crying out for help. Mm -hmm. I think even in that, you've got to try to be cool headed as the yes. person helping them. Of they course, can't. of course. Because I don't think you know. I, I think in general, you know, there's there's very rare times when drastic measures is helpful yes so the key thing is when people are you know beside themselves you got to try to keep a cool head mm -hmm. you know think through some of the options we've talked about and make small changes and based on that you know make decisions because mm -hmm. i think when people are in panic mode they want to do drastic things you know they want to stop the drug double the drug add it in yeah. go to hospital yeah like somehow and it's not very you know it's, it's very easy for me to sitting here right now not in the middle of it but i've been i've been you know basically yes, you've there. been there Yes. And I know that I know that, you know, now I'm wearing a tweed jacket, but back then I was, you know, crying on my parents' floor. So yeah. it's, it's a yeah. circumstance. I still think 
you know, you've got to try to be yeah, cool headed and objective, make small yes. change and keep on updating your decision making based on what happens, you know, rather than make drastic change. I think that's, you know, that's not the answer to everything, but I think that's the, that's the approach that causes the, less, the least harm for people. Absolutely. I totally agree with you. I often say don't panic no matter what. Like we'll we'll come together and we'll make a different decision. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on to the next one. This is a quick question. You don't have to get super in depth with this, but but what do you think about withdrawal akathisia? And while they're still on, what is akathisia? What is your opinion on it? Do we even know what the heck it is? So, uh, I've had several discussions with different people about this recently. I mean, you know, I think it fits into the discussion we've been having. So I I see. I see withdrawal akathisia, so the sort of, you know, restlessness, pacing, terror that people get in withdrawal is, um, so there's a bit of, is there sound in the background? Is there some? Oh, no. no. Can you hear something? Okay. No, it's just, just my mind playing tricks again. No. Um, <laughs> I I think it, it's it's the, you know, it's the extreme version of withdrawal. You know, I think if you go, you know, if you go too quickly, I see a lot of people who have the early elements of akathisia, which I think I, I think I experienced, you know, not full blown akathisia, but when I was running every day to get some relief, when I felt terrorized, I don't think if I'd been in front of a psychiatrist, I would have diagnosed with akathisia because I wasn't pacing recently. But I think, you know, if I, because I actually didn't go to zero, I went to one milligram at that point. I think if I kept going, that would have where it would have ended up. So I see withdrawal akathisia you know, as the culmination of that destabilization you know, plunging too fast up to the surface in the bends or tapering off the drugs too quickly. And it leads to, you know, a complete disruption of the neurological system. Right. Um, and, 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 and because withdrawal akathisia fits in my mind into the most extreme version of withdrawal, I use the same approach where my first port of call in someone who was coming off one drug and got into trouble would be to go back, would be to go to the dose at which they'd been stable and to wait. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that's the other thing I think that if you talking about reinstatement here or going up I don't know, or up dosing, um, you know, people who are on a stable dose of medication and they, you know, miss a week because they go on holiday and they forget, to take, they forget to take their drugs. If they go back on the drugs, normally things get better in a few days. You know, everyone's had that experience. You miss a day or two, you get some zaps, you go back on it. It's fine. Right. I think when you're into more trouble when you're tapering and you've, you know, you've been off on a lower dose for a couple of months. I often think that stabilizing can take weeks or months afterwards. Sure. Yeah. Um, so again, not to draw on this anecdote so much, but I've had that. Mm -hmm. I've at different points got impatient. I've, you know, halved my drug and I've got into hell, you know, probably not akathisia level hell, but whatever the stages before you get into that. Mm -hmm. And I have gone, I have gone back to the dose I was on and it's taken me three months to get to settle down. Yeah. Um, and so sometimes I wonder when people say it's not getting any better, it's not getting any better. I better do something. Yeah, different. they didn't wait long enough. Yeah, I think they didn't wait long enough. And and some yeah. people get out of it, and then you know, it's, again, it's very hard to be firm here because I can't. If I was, if I knew what the research said you've got to wait three months, then I'd say, hang on, hang on. But right. it's very hard. But I do have that experience from my own first time experience that it has taken me months on yeah. two occasions to stabilize after going up, and and I did feel terrible whilst back up on the higher dose of drug. Mm -hmm. And I can see some people then think, oh, it's the drug doing it to me to stop the drug. Exactly. And I think, I think that's, I often think that's not quite right. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm sort of growing on my experience, but I, I, I often think that people do improve after up dosing. It just takes longer. But I think that the mind entertains all these other well, and I've seen just recently, I've seen someone hold for six months and another person held for eight months and both of them got stable. It just took different lengths yeah. of time. I think the trouble is some people are so destabilized, they can't imagine holding in that state. It does not feel so my, like my sustainable, argument, you know? So my argument to that is, so hold on, first of all, say I've held on, on occasions for six months and nine months. Mm -hmm. I held for nine months once. I was given a steroid and a fluoroquinolone. Oh no! Which I didn't know I didn't understand then. I took it, and it knocked me into a terrible state of withdrawal that lasted for nine months. And I did I did nothing in that time. I didn't I didn't reduce any of my medication. I did nothing. I just I did a lot of reading, and I sort of understood yeah. what had happened to me. I just made no changes. And after nine months, it was about eighty percent better, and I and I resumed. Wow. So you know, I don't know if I'm just like a cold blooded, 
you know you're just like in. you're you're just like me like so, people use this against me they're like angie i'm not strong like you i wasn't in the military and i'm like no this will take you to your knees and you will have to be strong no matter what your upbringing was it has oh, nothing I'm, to do with it i'm but, not strong no no but no but but, no but strength is not like this is hard for everyone it, you know what i'm saying like yeah. i don't i can't even explain it it's it's the I, worst I, I, you know I'm, I'm a terrible coward i i so everything i do is based on cowardice um, I did that because I was afraid. I don't want to mess things up further. I'd rather mm. be honest. so. So what I what I sometimes say to people is, you know, they're feeling really terrible and they say, "I can't handle this." I say, "But you can do things that will make it worse." So right. if 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 um, you know you feel you know awful, you know, I better do something. But if you if you know you stop your drug abruptly or something, you know, you can get worse. People who have said to me, "I, I can never feel worse." Trust me, you can. Yes, you can. It can get worse. Yeah. So so I. Well, you know, so out of fear or strength, you do you do what you have to do. Yeah, you know? I mean, I'm I'm, just all, I'm all about you know I just I guess I'm a, I'm risk averse. I'm all about doing things that will minimize. So if you decide you're gonna you know someone says I must stop this drug, this drug is poison, then I say at least stop it you know oh, more quickly than you are, but don't you know work towards that. So I'm always trying to a bit probably trying to slow people down everywhere. I try to slow them down tapering. Yeah. I try to slow them down when they make decisions. So I'm I think I'm always I'm always the guy saying, just back it up. Me a bit. too. And and I would and let me insert my own analogy here because I often say I'm the queen of analogies because you have to have lots of analogies to explain this stuff. But I say there's a balance. This is rat poison. It's poisoning me. And you, if you taper it too quickly, you're going to jump off a bridge. So you, it's your job to like keep that balance even. Like yeah, it might be to you, but slow. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yes. Actually, I'll yeah. just say I'll just say one thing about it because it comes up a lot when I speak to people. I think it comes a lot from the benzodiazepine forums that are very concerned with tolerance and so you mm -hmm. shouldn't stay on the drug you should keep going yeah i i think there's a kernel of truth to that but it's it's i think it's taken a bit too far mm -hmm. so i just you know tolerance is something that happens to a drug as soon as you start it you know if you think about caffeine mm -hmm. when you drink your first cup of caffeine you know you're on the roof as a teenager you know two weeks later it's already having half the effect most mm -hmm. tolerance happens in the first four weeks on a drug you know, being on a drug for 10 years versus five years doesn't cause a lot more tolerance. You know, there's actually, okay. it's actually another hyperbola. You know, tolerance happens like this. It reaches a bit of a steady state. So people say, don't hold because you'll be getting, you'll be developing tolerance. And the answer is you will develop tolerance if you hold for six months. But if you've already been on the drug for five years, the amount of tolerance you're going to develop is about 1%. You know, it's a tiny amount. Whereas the stability you're going to get from letting things settle down will be much greater. So I say, I say to people, there's a mild tolerance tax that is there. You know, I'm not denying that, but compared to the stability surplus, I don't know why I've been doing my tax recently. I guess why I'm talking in technologies. <laughs> the stability surplus is worth much more than the tolerance tax. That makes so sense. I, I think that's, I think that's one of the more negative um, kind of circulating rumors out there that you can't, you've got to keep going. You've got to keep coming off. You, yes. You've got to keep tapering. Because there's a there's a train coming for you that's called tolerance. I think tolerance is already built into a lot of people's um, you know experience. And spending an extra six months or nine months or a year after being on a drug for ten years is not going to cause them a whole lot more trouble. But coming off rapidly is, as you say, jumping off a bridge. You know, is worse for you than taking a bit of rat poison. Cautious. Yes. Oh, good point. Okay, so to sum this all up. Because we're talking probably about the most extreme circumstances, the people that we see in our community, not the average um, person taking a psychotropic drug right now, just in the general public. But if you could sum it up in maybe like three to five sets, you know, sentences, what is the best case scenario for someone to get off a psychotropic drug? Like speed taper. What is your best advice? Like a nugget. <laughs> uh that's a trick question. I mean, not so, really. Um, no, I, I mean, just like, what's the best? Like, I, I often think the way I'm the way I'm thinking here is like, I call it like healing mindset. We are just chopping off a, an iceberg. You have to do it the best you can. Your job is to keep your nervous system as stable as you can. Like, let's support your body with good food and human relationships. Like, you know, it's not a perfect science. We're doing the best we can. From your perspective, I think that would be something like a patient-led taper, listening to your symptoms, taking, you know what I mean? Like, what would you? I mean, I mean, of course, I mean, I mean, broadly, the same thing applies to everybody, you know, uh, that, you know, the, the, you know so there's three major principles to coming off the drugs. You know, one is to do it slowly and slowly means, you know, not weeks. It means months. There are people that can come off in months. I, I see them in my clinic. Um, 
you know, but for a lot of people it means more than a year, you know, it depends on how long you've been on it for. I put a little set of, you know, people's risks are increased by duration of use, dose of use, what medication they've been on, their experience in the past. I try, you know, I don't have the greatest tools, but there are tools that we've developed that put you in a, you know, very high, high, medium or low risk category. And mm-hmm. I sort of, people in a low risk category who've been on drugs for, you know, a few months, not particularly, uh, you know, not particularly hard drugs to come off, haven't had trouble in the past, you know, often can come off in a few months. You know, for example, there's a study that will come out soon that will show that in people who've been on antidepressants for more than a year, about two fifths can come off in weeks. You know, I don't, there's not great long to follow up to, to that. So I would err on the side of caution. I would say, look, I would say to almost everybody, you need to take it at least three months, probably six months. Why, mm-hmm. you know, if you're on the drug for an extra four months of exposure, it's worth reducing the risks. Uh, you know, on the other side of things, people have been on multiple drugs, had huge trouble coming off. Uh, they're on drugs that are very hard to come off. You know, they generally take more than two years to come off. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, so the first thing is slow, which means somewhere between months and years. Second principle is coming off at a rate you can tolerate. You know, if there was if there was thousands of studies, I'd be able to plug into a computer and say, you know, you're 33, you've been on three drugs, this is the dose, you know, bing, bing, bang, you'd you'd be off in 11 months. But of course, we don't know anything, we don't know anything like that. Mm-hmm. And so that's why, you know, the, the main approach is test a reduction, see how it goes, use that to work out what rate you can go at. And the third principle is that hyperbolic you know, uh, shape to things. The last few milligrams are the hardest. You know, I've got all these tables that take people through the exact hyperbolas, so what they don't, see. which is very yeah. similar to, you know, the, the rules of thumb that people use, you know, on these uh, support forums, these uh, percentage reductions are pretty good approximations of that, although they do go for a bit long at the end. So when you keep on making 10% reductions, it does kind of go, it becomes forever. like, a, you know, it goes forever. And then people say you got to go quicker at the end, but no one knows where. So to some degree, understanding the hyperbola makes that a bit simpler to understand where to do that. Um, and then exactly like you've said, alongside that, you know, people always say, is there a supplement? Is there a magic bullet? Is there a treatment that can make it easier? And, and I think, you know, basically the answer to that is no. Um, you know, I, I say to people, if if there's a drug that makes your withdrawal symptoms better, I'd be worried about it That's because, the same. you know, I've had people come up and say, I found a drug, you know, it's called Valium, it's called alcohol, it's called codeine. Mm-hmm. If a drug, you know, improves your withdrawal symptoms, it's very likely to be dependence forming itself and cause withdrawal mm-hmm. when you come off it. So yeah. I sort of think you're sort of, if you're using another drug to get off one drug, you know, you're like, you're, you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. Pay Paul, know? exactly. And Paul's going to, you know, he's going to come back and he's going to be potentially nastier than Peter. Worse. So it's just yeah. to go at the rate you can tolerate for that drug. And then, you know, uh, you know, healthy food, healthy diet and exercise and sleep. I, I've got a small thing for, it's not for everybody, for intermittent fasting, you know, and 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 that I, 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 I something I was into well before I got into mm-hmm. tapering. I think it does make people feel a bit calmer. And I think it does make withdrawal a little bit better. It's not a magic bullet. I don't think you can stop eating and come off the drugs. But I think it's one right. tool, in a, in a, you know, everyone has something, you know, mindfulness, meditation works for you, then that's mm-hmm. the goat. So I think, yep. you know, I, I think the main thing is to avoid exposure to a huge number of other drugs whilst coming off it. That's the, that's the trap. Um, you know, and otherwise, you know, I think, and I think I gotta say out of all the psychological techniques people talk about, I think the number one is distraction. You know, I think yes. very, you know, I mean, maybe I'm not an enlightened being enough, but it's very hard to kind of, you know, meditate your way through feeling awful. No. But I think, I think people, if you have something to do, something to look after, something to a project to work on, it's one of the best ways to keep your mind off the unpleasantness you're going through. And I, I, yes. you know, I, I say to people, there's a, there's a, there's sort of a, a therapeutic range. You know, if you do too much work and you're stressed out, that's gonna make things harder. But also doing nothing, depending. I mean, if you're really unwell, you gotta do what you gotta do. Right. But if you're somewhere in the middle. I think you've got to find a therapeutic band of enough activity, enough engagement that you're not thinking about your own, you know, horrible symptoms, exactly. but not so much yeah. you're having panic attacks from the stress. I think that's right. the job. That's the job of people in, in withdrawal is to find, because it's not so easy to do, but to try to find what's in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. I think that when we're, there's this inner focus, like mindfulness or meditation or um, even like body scan meditation, it's like, I don't want to feel that more. Like, come on, it's it's better to escape the body. I know that's like against all the anxiety advice and things out there to help people. But 
like to get them in the environment somehow in nature or in a job or a project or a puzzle, anything outside of your own sensation. That seems to be the best. I agree with you. Okay. I, I think- Last thing, um, deprescribing guidelines. Can you tell me about the book forthcoming, what it was like? What do we, what should we expect? We have the link we'll put down below. So does this end at the hour? Am I am I against the clock? I can run over a couple minutes if you want. It's up to yeah, you. I, over. I don't have another meeting now. Okay, um, so 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 the Morsi Deprescribing Guidelines is it's basically a handbook on how to stop all common uh, antidepressants, benzodiazepines, Z drugs, and gabapentinoids. And I spent the last three years writing it. It's totally ruined my life. Um, it's part of a series of books called the Maudsley Prescribing Guidelines, which um, is outside of America, the most widely used psychiatric handbook for, for psychiatrists. So every every psychiatrist I know has in their briefcase a copy of the Maudsley Prescribing Guidelines. In America, it's number two after Stephen Stahl's books, which I think are completely mad, uh, where uh, he, he, you know, if one drug works, give two drugs, if two drugs works, give three drugs. Five. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, so in other words, it's a, it's a quite a well-respected series of books that already has, you know, it's sort of seen as authoritative amongst psychiatrists to some degree amongst GPs and pharmacists who specialize in prescribing. And so, you know, that's why I sort of jumped at the opportunity to write a book as part of that series, because rather than just, you know, it being, you know, written by me in my bedroom, uh, printed on the internet, you know, it comes with a little bit of built-in uh, authority to it and I wrote it with a professor of psychopharmacology who you know runs one of the biggest pharmacies in uh, pharmacy services departments in the main psychiatric hospital in Europe actually the Maudsley and he you know he's been putting out these textbooks now for 30 years and he's seen as a you know a a, um, a, a big authority in the area and he's a nice guy um, and so we work on it together and so we hope that you know it's aimed at a mainstream audience you know, that this is, we're basically saying, look, safely stopping medications is a very important part of high quality medical practice. You know, anyone who's prescribing the drugs should know how to stop them. You know, it's the same way you would, you supply cars with brakes. So, you know, the the, the messaging of the book is a little bit of a balance between my views and his views. So it, it's, it's uh, it talks about, you know, the limited efficacy of a lot of these different drugs. Um, I don't know if people are aware, but for example, for benzodiazepines in England, you know, most official guidelines say do not prescribe these drugs for more than four weeks. It's not, it's not, it's not, they're not as widely used as they are in America. So we sort of focus on some of those issues, the issues with being on the drugs, the reasons why people want to come off the drugs. You know, a lot of people have found these drugs helpful, potentially in the short term, but the the side effects outweigh the beneficial effects, you know, things like emotional numbing, wanting to have children, weight gain, uh, you know, or a whole series of different side effects from trouble with sleep to concentration, memory issues. You know, I think number one in there that I've seen in my clinic is emotional numbing. You know, I think that's the, the number one reason people want to come off these drugs. They yeah. just feel like they're not by themselves. Um, you know, or you know, a lot of people are on these drugs for longer than guidelines suggest. You know, a lot of people are put on these drugs because of a very stressful period in their lives where, you know, they, they went through a divorce, they lost their job, they... You know, they're in their twenties. I think being in your twenties is a is a condition in itself. Um, but where you have to find your form. Um, you know, and people get put on or or after having a child, and then people are on these drugs still twenty five years later or fifteen years later, and you know, yeah. almost nobody would argue that there really is something there to treat. And so a lot of people are on these drugs for much too long. You know, a lot of people also have been given this idea that there's something wrong with their brains, there's a chemical deficiency. You know, and we know that's just not the case. We've done some work on that the last couple of years. You know, I think people. Essentially, you know, I, I, I like to tell people um, by the age of 45, uh, have a guess what proportion of people meet the criteria for a mental illness. Um, uh, 80. Yeah, 80, 86. 86%. Mm-hmm. So in other words, most people, you know, by their, by their 40s have met the criteria for DSM. You know, it's not just do you feel blue. It means you're ticking all the boxes. In other words, it's incredibly common to go through a period of, and most of that is anxiety and depression. It's incredibly common to go through a period of feeling down or anxious. You know, I don't think, you know, it doesn't mean you've got something wrong with your brain. It doesn't mean you're deficient in some way. It's a very normal part of being human. It often it often is because of what we've been through. And so being on a drug 15 years after divorce doesn't make sense. And nor does the idea of relapse. 
relapse. It's very hard to have a relapse of divorce or a relapse of starting off university yes. in a new city. So I think, you know, I talk about relapse a lot in my papers because that's part of what people talk about. But I don't, I'm not sure I believe in that for most people. I don't think most people have a recurrent, you know, episodic disorder. I think most people have had hard, hard periods in their lives. Yes. And then we go through in the book, you know, some of the principles I've talked about, but the 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 nub of the book is for every specific drug, you know, for for Effexor, for Symbolta, for Lexapro, for Xanax, Clonopin, uh, Valium, is step-by-step guidance how to work out what risk category people are in. Are they going to be low, moderate, or high? And then appropriate um, starting points that roughly correspond to, you know, if you're extremely high risk, a 5% reduction, if you're high, 10%. And then, and then because there are people that can go at 25% and even 50%, mm-hmm. yep. you know, because sometimes, because we, we, we're speaking to a very wide range of people, some people are on the drugs for three months, you know, it doesn't make sense to tell them to come off over years, that's going to cause them more trouble than, than it's worth. Right. So we try to guide people into what risk category they're in, how to start. And there is kind of, you know, doctors and clinicians like guides. So there is, these are the doses to go through based on the, the receptor occupancy with kind of red signs everywhere saying you know this is just a table the main thing is how the person feels they don't feel great you know the table is wrong right not not the person and and when it says you know go to the slower version if not go to the slower version it explains how to do micro tapering as a kind of other alternative it talks about all the different um formulations of the drug that are available in every country so if you want to come off effexor it'll tell you if there's a liquid in your country if you have to count beads, if if um, or if you can get it compounded, so it goes through every single option in Australia, in Canada, in Europe, America. Um, so you so you, everyone knows what in England, and so so everyone knows what is available. It goes through troubleshooting. It talks about some of the things we talked about: how to manage withdrawal akathisia, how to manage protective withdrawal. You know, not without huge definitive answers, but showing what is known from different research. And so we hope it makes it very easy for clinicians to use. And, and and learn through and also we have you know the back of our minds that probably enlightened patients might want to buy it for themselves uh, either to use themselves or to share with their doctors because you know I, I one one problem I hope we're, we're solving is there's look there's overlap with the Ashton manual and what we've done there certainly is I actually think the Ashton manual is too quick in for certain people I and agree, so yeah. it actually has, it's taken a lot of what the Ashton Manual says, but there's also slower versions and we've introduced a few. You know, I also think, I think switching across to Valium is a good option for some people, but not for most people. Yeah. And, and so it, it offers that. And I think the advantage that our book has over something like the Ashton Manual is, I think sometimes people bring the Ashton Manual to their doctors and the doctor kind of rolls their eyes and says, you've printed something off the internet. I think it will be harder for people to roll their eyes at something in the Maudsley guideline series because it is very well respected. You know, it's you know almost like having Harvard on the front cover. So it's I'm sure there are doctors that will roll their eyes because there always are, but I, I think less so. And so I, I hope it will be a little bit of an advocacy tool for patients you know, to give to their their physicians. I you know sort of say you know this might be the best early Easter gift for that special prescriber somebody in your life. Uh, you know, I love so it. I'll, Put a bow on top. I love yeah, that. Exactly. It's excellent. What a what a contribution that will be. I'm so happy to see that, Mark. And I'm sorry we ruined your life for a couple of years. I'm so sorry, but yeah, that's a lot of work. I mean, a worthy a worthy use of your time. I would say, for the just for the change of paradigm. Hopefully, it's amazing. Okay, yes. so I think we're coming to the end. Do you have anything you else you want to say about any of your research, patient experiences, anything in that? That we left out anything actually maybe i'll end on a personal note um okay so you, i think you said to me once you want to talk about hope at the end look yes. I, I would say i probably haven't had the hardest route off these drugs out of everybody i've seen you know i, I don't think I've, I haven't been in months and months of of uh you know terrifying akathisia but i have been through some hard experiences it was certainly the worst experience of my life coming off these drugs yeah, on yeah. you know and i've i've now i mean at the end of a I mean, I hope I'm near the end of a five and a half year taper. Um, but coming off these drugs has basically transformed my life because, um, you know, when I was on five drugs, I was actually looking at taking early medical retirement 
because I thought I can't think straight. You know, at one point I I had top medical school, but that's you know that's obviously well in my past. My brain has turned to mush since then. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't keep up with people. My colleagues, I can't keep up with people. And you know, since coming off the drugs, it hasn't been an easy road. But you know, I have got back a lot of my capacities. I I feel my ability to uh, to to think and to remember things is a lot better. I'm working a lot more than I was able to in the past. You know, and of course, I I put a lot of uh, you know, worth in my intellectual ability. That's what, you know, that's what I do. That's my, that's my life. So getting that back has, you know, really been, you know, a great joy in my life worth, you know, worth all the pain I've gone through. Mm -hmm. And I see that again and again in people, you know, out there, you know, withdrawal is awful, you know, it's not going to be an easy road, but, but on the other side of things, you, know, you get back to yourself. And I think that's, that makes it all worthwhile. So I, you know, I'd sort of say, keep going. There's a better side on the other side. Don't, don't give up. If you have to crawl, crawl. You know, I've done a lot of crawls in my time. So, you know, you, you you can get there. You can get there by crawling. I agree with you, Mark. I think I think that's the only reason because we can't possibly do this job if all we see is suffering. You know what I mean? Coaching people through this or consulting with from an academic perspective and doing all the research that you do. If you don't see people get their lives back on the other side, I see it all the time. I love it. It's the joy. I see beautiful things. I cry with clients because I'm just like, oh, it's so beautiful. When they say, I just took my last beat of Effexor, it's like, hooray, we did it. You did it, you know? Oh, so yes, thank you for all your contributions. Thank you for that personal note at the end. Um, it's by way of personal experience that we come to find this and try to help people get through it. You know, I often think like you're throwing people a rope and we're trying to just help them get to the other side. So exactly. thank you so much. So if people want to order the book, I put the um, the links will be below in the comments and in the caption. Mark, anything else that you want to share? Like, how do people find you if they want to follow you, if they want to keep up to breast on your work? Where do they go? So I've got a, I've got a crappy website at, at markhorowitz.org. You can look at it. I'm on Twitter at, at Mark Horow. I post a lot of my academic work. Um, yeah, the, the Morsley guidelines is on sale at Amazon, you know, encourage your friends and doctors and pharmacists to, to get it. I, I hope I hope it'll become normalized is my aim. It'll be as normal as the prescribing guidelines that everyone will have it. So everyone will need to have it, you know, so that then it'll become normalized to uh, to, uh, you know, deprescribe safely. And then I can I can get a, I can go on a holiday. That's my that's my aim. You need a break. You need a break. And so when does it come out, March? Because I know I pre-ordered it in November. Well, but so it's a bit funny. The Kindle is out now sort of earlier but the actual book i think in america is out in february and in australia in march and in europe somewhere in the middle so next few awesome. weeks awesome all right well we look forward to the release of it thank you so much all right thank you everybody for watching um i hope you've enjoyed this conversation please share it and just comment below if you have any questions quick comments we'll see if we can get to them later but thank you so much for joining us mm -hmm.